So the first two lectures, last time and this time, I'm trying to lay a theoretical basis for Jewish gender boundary and the Jewish gender hierarchy, what in theory or in principle was the boundary and the hierarchy. And then in lectures three, four, and five, I'm going to discuss the challenges to the principle and the changes that uh, occurred in fact. So last time and this time, we're talking in theory and the next time and the two times after that, we're going to be talking about what happened on the ground. <clears throat> so at the end of the Middle Ages, uh, 14th, 15th century, I would say that we had predominantly two types of arrangements for women in the synagogue. The first type is what I would call women as guests. Here you see the famous Altneuschule in Prague. And when it was built, there was no provision made for women. It was built in 1270. Uh, there was no space allocated specifically for women. The women's section that you see today was not added until the 17th century. So why do I call women guests in the synagogue? Well, here you have a woodcut from Augsburg in the 16th century from Johannes Pfefferkorn, a con convert to Christianity who represented Jewish life in some ways. And here is a picture of the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. There you see blowing the shofar. And the women are behind a temporary, temporary uh, divider, a temporary divider. Uh, there's another picture. So you see it's, it's missing in this picture. Uh, what these gentlemen are doing is this must be Yom Kippur and they're being whipped uh, as a uh, penance. You see here the Kohanim giving the uh, priestly blessing, the Birkat Kohanim. Here, by the way, is the Shabbos Koi lighting the candle. The non-Jew lights the candles. And the women behind their temporary divider. It may be that the women came only for the special events, like blowing the shofar, like the priestly blessing. Uh, in any case, there was no specific pl place allocated for them. And there was a temporary barrier behind which they stood. And that's why I call it women as guests in the synagogue. The second model has been defined by Ilya Rodov and Vladimir Levin as the hierarchical synagogue. And here you see a picture of the Worms synagogue in Germany, built originally in 1175. And in 1213, a Viber school, that is a women's synagogue, was added to it. So you see here the original synagogue in 1175, and the Viber school added in 1213. And here are views from different sides outside. Note that the original synagogue has a higher roof than the Weibershul, the women's synagogue. So why do, is this called hierarchical? Oh, and one other thing. Uh, in the pictures that we have starting in the 19th century, this opening is actually a doorway. Now it may be that originally it was a window, there were six windows. And at some point it was made into a doorway or it might have originally been a doorway. We really don't know. So a doorway that connects the vibrant tool with the tool. So what do we mean by hierarchical? <clears throat> well, first of all, the original building was built without any kind of, uh, as Ratna team, any kind of women's uh, arrangement. So again, women would have been guests in the synagogue. 
Some 38 years later, they did build the Viber School, the women's synagogue. But note, in the literature, we have the original synagogue, that is the men's synagogue, not called the Menor Shul, it's just called the Shul, that is the synagogue. And with it is the Viber Shul. So it's obviously an annex to the, the main synagogue. So it's of a lower status. Also, whether there was a door connecting the Worms women's section to the men's or not, we do have a literary source uh, which says that uh, discussing halachic problem, whether people who are not actually in the room of the synagogue but can see and hear into it, if they are part of synagogue service. And uh, part of the answer is, well, yes, they are. And the proof is that the Ezrat Nashim proves it. In some communities, there isn't even an opening between the Ezrat Nashim and the main synagogue. In other words, whether there was informed or not, there were other synagogues in which there was no doorway between uh, or even any communication between the women's synagogue and the men's. And finally, of course, the architecture itself. With the men's synagogue having the higher roof and the women's synagogue, the lower one. And we'll see that repeated many times uh, in, as the lectures go on. Another way in which uh, the presence of women in the synagogue was uh, de-emphasized or limited was in connection with ritual uh, purity or impurity. Now, as we heard last time from Sarit, starting in the Talmud, we have references that certain women at the time that they were menstruating would uh, take upon themselves ritual limitations. They would not participate fully in the ritual life when they were menstruants. And in Sefer HaRav Yah, a very important medieval source, halakhic authority uh, from the 12th to early 13th century, uh, he mentions, Women exercise stringency and piety when they are nida, that is when they are menstruants, by not entering the synagogue. Moreover, when praying, they do not stand behind women who are nida, who are menstruants. So here he was reporting that some women have taken upon themselves an extra stringency, a chumrah, that when they are menstruants, they don't even come to the synagogue. Some years later, in what was one of the main medieval halakhic sources, the Sharei Dura, we go from optional to mandatory. The Sharei Dura says, a woman who is menstruating should not wear fine clothing or adorn herself, comb her hair or cut her nails. Neither should she say the name of God on the days when she menstruates nor should she enter the synagogue. So we've gone from some women do this, take upon themselves the extra stringency to women should take upon themselves restrictions and not come into the synagogue when they are menstruating. Now there are other institutions that define the gender boundary and the gender hierarchy. Uh, I assume most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Jewish marriage ceremony. Well, in my lifetime, I have seen a struggle in how this ceremony has developed to make it more uh, two-sided because the original ceremony is very much centered on the man, the groom, and not the bride, by which I mean it is the groom that gives the bride a ring. Formally speaking, he is 
acquiring her, that is, he is uh, taking her into his household. He is the one that talks during the ceremony. So that it's clear that he is the main actor and she is in a uh, subordinate role. She's a supporting, supporting actor or divorce until today. We have problems uh, that halakhically only the husband can initiate divorce. The wife, except under certain circumstances, which I won't get into, uh, by and large, the wife cannot initiate a divorce. So if a woman wants to get divorced and her husband doesn't want to divorce her, she is stuck. Uh, so again, the man has the superior position. Or Halitza, if a man dies without children, according to biblical law, his brother is supposed to marry his wife, his widow, and have children on the dead man's name to keep his name alive. However, the, there's a possibility that the brother doesn't want to marry his sister-in-law. And so he performs a ceremony called chalitza. Medieval rabbis decided that the brother-in-law should never marry the widow and should always perform chalitza. However, it is his prerogative, formally speaking, he has to decide that he's going to do the chalitza. And if he doesn't, and the rabbis don't let him marry her, so again, the woman is stuck. She's neither, uh, she's no longer married, she's a widow, but she cannot get married until she goes through the chalitza ceremony. And of course, this can be grounds for extortion by uh, evil brothers-in-law. Or there's the rule of meneket chavero, which literally means a woman who is nursing the baby of another man. If a woman is pregnant and her husband dies, and then she has the baby, she is not allowed to remarry for 24 months. The reason for this is if she remarries, she may get pregnant and her milk will stop and the new husband will not be interested in supporting uh, the baby whose father was the dead first husband uh, and the baby will be left uh, without any food and perhaps even die. So a woman is not supposed to get married for two years after having a baby. Uh, to not get married to a new husband. Well, again, this puts a woman in uh, an inferior position. Uh, a man whose wife dies, let's say he has some other children. He wants to get married as soon as possible. He's allowed to get married uh, from three months after his wife died. Well, he needs a wife to take care of his children, to take care of his home, to take care of him as the gender uh, division would have it in those days. The woman whose husband died, let us say she has other children. She needs someone to support her. She needs someone to share uh, the family responsibilities. She needs someone to provide a home, but she's not allowed to do anything about it for two years. We'll see next week how that uh, gains some flexibility. And then there are inheritance laws. According to uh, the strict Torah inheritance laws, uh, daughters do not inherit unless uh, there are no sons. But if there are sons, uh, they inherit and the daughters don't. So uh, again, the daughters are in a disadvantageous position, not being able to get an uh, inheritance from their uh, father or parents for that matter. Again, we'll see how this changes. And then of course the modesty rules, 
what women can wear, what kind of activity they can go into. Uh, last week, we talked about the verse in the Bible uh, that is always understood as kol kvoda bat melech penima, the king's daughter's honor is inside, that is she should stay inside her home, be modest, and we discussed how this limits women's activities. So here are some legal institutions that very clearly mark a gender border and a gender hierarchy. Then of course, there is the famous rule Women are exempt from positive time-bound commandments. Uh, the Torah has 613 commandments. 365 are negative. Don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery. These are negative commandments. And 248 positive commandments. Do eat matzah on Pesach. Do sit in the sukkah. Do honor your father and mother. Well, women are exempt from these positive commandments, which depend on time. So for example, prayer that depends on time, or as we saw last week, uh, wearing tzitzit, which you only do during the daytime. Women don't have to do these things. Uh, taking the lulav or sitting in the sukkah, which depend on a certain time. You do them at a certain time. Women don't have to do these things. This exemption, of course, means that women are available to be, as we saw last week, facilitators. The men have certain duties they must perform at precise times, but they need a support staff. And the women are the support staff. The women prepare the kiddush in the synagogue, the, the collation in the synagogue, for example. The women take care of the children so that the men can, uh, can get to the synagogue on time and do what they have to do there. The women take care of the house and prepare the meal so that when the ritual in the synagogue is over, the men come home and have the food on the table. So by exempting women from positive time-bound commandments, what we're doing is enhancing their role as support staff, as facilitators. The last time we spoke about the book of Genesis, Breshit, and uh, what I consider to be the genesis of gender. And I claimed last week that in chapter one, when God creates the human in his image, there is no gender. The human male and female in the uh, first chapter in what's called the world of Tov Ma'od, the world of very good, the world, the way God intended it to be, no gender. In the Garden of Eden, I tried to convince you that there was no gender, that gender only enters into the picture with the punishment of Adam and Eve for eating the fruit in the Garden of Eden. And what I claimed was that gender is part of the punishment, but gender is also part of what makes them human. And until today, we are uh, dealing with the implications of that. Now, I mentioned in passing that uh, Judaism did not really do anything with the idea of original sin. Adam and Eve sinned, they were punished, that had certain implications, part of which was gender. But Judaism never dwelled on the idea of original sin as Christianity does. But there's an exception to that. The sin of Eve, of Chava, does become a kind of original sin that echoes through the ages. And it's interesting that Adam's sin, well, that's dealt with. We dealt with that in chapter three of Genesis and now we forget about it. But Eve's sin continues to resonate. And this is seen 
in what are considered to be the three special mitzvot, the three special commandments, uh, positive commandments that women are supposed to uh, observe. In Hebrew, they are called mitzvot chana, which is an acronym for hala nero, uh, uh, nida, hadlakat nerot. We're talking about the mitzvah to separate a portion of the dough when you bake something in memory of the portion that was given to the temple in Jerusalem. Nida, all of the rules concerning menstruation and the women's biological cycle, and especially going to the mikvah after the menses have uh, concluded. And Havakatne wrote, lighting candles on Friday night. Now, what you see in front of you is the cover of a modern edition of a 16th century book. This was edited by Edward Fram. Uh, the book is called Seder Mitzvot Nashim, The Order of Women's Commandments. It was written in Yiddish. And the book was to explain to women how they should observe these special mitzvot of women. So in the period we're talking about, the early modern period, 16th century, we have not just this book, several books codifying these three mitzvot for women. And how are these mitzvot explained? Why do women have to observe these special mitzvot? Well, hala, separating a portion of dough when you bake, and that portion is in memory of what was contributed to the temple. Why? Well, Israel was supposed to be Kodesh Yisrael, Ladonai Reshit Tevuato. Israel was supposed to be holy to the Lord, the first fruits of its harvest. Note that word first or Reshit in Hebrew. But woman corrupted Israel. Now, of course, you may say, what do you mean woman corrupted Israel? There was no Israel in the Garden of Eden. When Eve ate of the fruit and offered it to Adam, there was no Israel. So she didn't corrupt Israel, but there's a saying, uh, a rabbinic saying, in Meshivin al Adrash, you don't challenge a uh, Midrash, you don't challenge uh, a homiletic interpretation. <clears throat> so Eve corrupted Israel to make restitution. Reshit Aristotechem Tarimu Chala. The first yield of your baking you shall set aside. So Israel was supposed to be the first fruit since Israel was corrupted. So now Israel must give the first yield of its baking. And who does that? Women, because it was a woman who was responsible for the corruption. Here you see a picture of an ancient mikvah, an ancient ritual bath. So nida, all of the rules pertaining to menstruation and the biological cycle. Well, according to the Midrash, Eve beat Adam into eating the apple. Of course, it wasn't an apple, but uh, later sources thought of it as an apple. So he would also now die. She shed his blood. Her penitence is she gets her menstrual period and sheds her own blood with accompanying pain once a month and must immerse as a way of purifying from her sin. So it's a kind of Sisyphus. Because of the sin of uh, shedding Adam's blood, making it that he would die. So every month, women symbolically die. They must be purified from that. And we start all over again the next month. And finally, Hadlakat Nevrot, lighting of the candles. With her sin of gluttony, why gluttony? Because she was a glutton, she wanted to eat the fruit. Woman darkened the world and extinguished the light. Women now 
kindle the Shabbat lights to symbolically rekindle what the first woman extinguished. So Eve's sin resonates throughout all the generations because she darkened the world, all Jewish women must lighten the world uh, at least once a week. Now let's talk about education. The Mishnah says, the Mishnah is uh, dated around the uh, end of the second or the beginning of the first of the, the beginning of the third century of the common era. It's a rabbinic work of, of law. The Mishnah says, a non-Hebrew speaker who heard the Megillah, we're talking about Megillah Esther, the scroll of Esther that's read on Purim. So a non-Hebrew speaker who came to the land of Israel and heard them reading the Megillah in Hebrew has fulfilled the obligation. You have an obligation, every uh, Jew has an obligation to hear the Megillah on Purim. Well, then the Gemara, the Talmud asks, but he did not understand what they said. How can you say he fulfilled the obligation if he didn't understand the words? He just heard the Hebrew, but he didn't know the content of the book they were reading. The answer is, it is like the case of women and ignorant men. Ignorant men in Hebrew, uh, am ha'aretz, or in plural, ame ha'aretz, am ha'aretz. People, men who are uneducated, and this phrase, nashim ve'ame ha'aretz, women and ignorant men, is a common phrase uh, in rabbinic literature. So women and ignorant men also do not have to understand the Megillah to fulfill their obligation. They don't have to understand it. They just have to hear it. So in other words, they don't have to understand it. And they don't have a right to understand it. It's not important for them to understand it. All they have to do is sit and hear it. Now this attitude towards women's uh, education, I won't get into the Amharic part of it now, that women don't really need to be educated. Uh, again, in future weeks, we will discuss how this was uh, ameliorated, but it still had resonance for a long time. And I'm going to show you a picture now, not from the early modern period, but from around 1900, the end of the 19th to the beginning of the 20th century, which I think captures this idea that starts in the Mishnah and we can still find uh, in modern times. Here in this picture, we see probably the teacher, maybe the father, but I would think the teacher with the little boy, the teacher is very proud that the boy can read the book, perhaps even understand it. Note how the boy is dressed, a nice hat, a suit, boots. And then we have what is ostensibly the boy's sisters sitting there, barefoot, dirty, no book, no one paying attention to them. And that expresses the idea that the Mishnah already pioneered. Women don't have to be educated. So again, gender boundary, men educated, women not. Now, I've been going according to Joan Wallach's paradigm refer to discuss uh, what the gender boundary is and how the gender hierarchy is established. So first we talked about symbolism, how Eve is a symbol for all women. Then we talked about concepts that men are actors and women are facilitators. Then we just finished speaking about institutions. The fourth category that Wallach Scott suggests is subjective identity. How people think about gender, how, what they think about, what is the proper behavior for each gender? How should men behave? How should women behave? So 
we go back to our friend from last week, Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, the author of the Ashkenazic part of the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. And in a section of the code, which talks about the grace after meals, Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals. So if you have at least three men, there is an introduction to the grace that you say. If you don't have three men, you don't say it. So Isterlis adds, optimally, women may form a grace quorum for themselves. In other words, if there are three women, they can also say the introduction. There may be no men. If there are at least three women, they constitute a quorum and they can say the introduction. But when the women eat with men, they are obligated and they fulfill their obligation through our quorum, even though they do not understand. So let's take the last phrase first, even though they do not understand. He's telling us that there are many, maybe most women in his time, the 16th century, who would not understand what they were saying in the Birkat Amazon, in the Grace After Meals. They weren't educated. But in addition, we have here what I would consider a Freudian slip. The women fulfill their obligation through our quorum. So I see here two things. First of all, it's obvious that Isserlis feels that he's addressing his book, the Shulchan Aruch, is being addressed to men. That's his audience. Secondly, he identifies with this audience. He's one of them. So what we have here is the boys against the girls. <laughs> the men have their quorum, the girls have their quorum. And sometimes we'll let the girls into our quorum. And now I'm bringing a text which is admittedly very extreme, probably the most extreme uh, example I could find. But I think that the margin tells you something about the center. Uh, the extreme is over here, then the margin, then the center is here. If the extreme is, uh, the margin is here, the center is here. Now this text is in a book called Sabaat Harivash, the will of the Baal Shem Tov. It's not the will of the Baal Shem Tov. What it is, is teachings of uh, the Magid of Mezerich person who was the leader of the uh, Hasidic movement after the Baal Shem Tov. And this passage says, he, that is a man, should love his wife as he loves his tefillin, <clears throat> only because they are God's commandments. But he should not ruminate over her, for she is but as in this example. A man cannot travel to the market except on horseback. But for this reason, would he love the horse? Is there greater foolishness than this? So it is in this world. A man needs a wife in order to perform his obligations to God to earn the world to come. He needs a wife to have children. He needs a wife to facilitate uh, his observance of the various mitzvot. But if he will leave off his holy dealings and think about his wife, is there greater foolishness than this? So again, this is an extreme statement, but obviously some people felt that uh, somebody like Gal Gadot and Wonder Woman uh, could never exist. That one's relationship to the closest woman you have is that of uh, the woman facilitating uh, for the man's fulfillment. And again, in the future lectures, we're going to see how this was ameliorated. <clears throat>
Now this picture, is not of a very famous Jewish woman, Glicko Bas Yehuda Hamo, better known as Glicko of Hamlin. Although she only lived for two years in Hamlin, she really lived most of her life in Hamburg. This picture is of one of her indirect descendants. I believe she was a great, great, great aunt of this lady who was Bertha Pappenheim, famous in her own right as uh, Freud's famous uh, female patient. She also was a social activist. She founded the Jewish Frauenbund, the Jewish women's organization and various other uh, social activities. And in 1910, she dressed up as if she were Glickel from the 17th century. Uh, and Leopold Pilichowski, the artist, drew her uh, as if she were Glickel. And of course, through the ages, people take this as Glickel's picture. It's not Glickel, it's Bertha Pappenheim. But it gives you some idea of what Glickel may have looked like. Now, as we will see in the last lecture, Glickel challenged the theoretical gender roles, the theoretical gender boundary. She crossed the boundary. Uh, she uh, upset the gender hierarchy. But what I want to show this evening is that even Glickel, even Glickel was subject to the conventional uh, identities of the genders. So for example, she writes in her memoirs, it is the duty of a man to support his wife and children respectively. Now she herself, when her husband was alive, was a full partner with him in their business. They were merchants, uh, they bought and sold pearls and various other uh, precious stones and other things as well. And once he died, she was left with 12 children, eight of whom were not married. She had to support uh, her single children and even help out her married children. And she did this all on her own. But even she, this accomplished businesswoman, says it is the duty of a man to support his wife and children respectively. She speaks in her book of various women whom she praises. One of them is the modest Tesla. He had no equal in the world, with exception of our mothers, the matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Rachel, and Leah. There was no woman like her for her religiosity and piety. In Yiddish, she says her uh, religiosity was her frumkeit, and piety, her chasidus, which is a kind of super erogatory uh, religiosity. And she was a woman of virtues that is an Eshet Chayel. Now Eshet Chayel, from the 31st chapter of, so of Proverbs, lists the virtues of the ideal woman, according to the book of Proverbs. However, in our period, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century, an Eshet Chayel is a woman who supports her family, a woman who is the breadwinner of her family. That's an Eshet Chayel. So on the one hand, it's the duty of a man to support his wife, but she's praising Tesla for being an Eshet Chayel, for supporting her family because her husband was too sick to work. Also note what else is important about Tesla. First of all, she's modest and she is very religious, very punctilious about her ritual life. And finally, she said at one point in her book, it is not fitting that I, an ordinary weak woman, interfere in some matter of business. Now, this is ridiculous. <laughs> she was anything but an ordinary weak woman. And she was constantly voicing her opinion and driving hard bargains, but still she felt at some point she had to say, 
I'm just a little woman. I shouldn't voice an opinion. So even someone like Glickel has to pay at least lip service to uh, the gender identities. Or another example is another woman that we're going to talk about, Leah Horvitz. You see here the booklet that she wrote, the Hina Imahos, which we will discuss in the fourth lecture. Leah Horvitz as well in this booklet asserts that women should have more cultural capital, more religious capital. But even she has to pay lip service to the conventional gender roles. So for example, she says, it is not often that a woman engages in Torah discourse, okay? I know it's not accepted for a woman to deal in Torah. Or women are talkative, gossiping in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Of course, men don't gossip in the synagogue on the Sabbath, but she puts that out there. And at one point she says, they should obey the rule. A proper woman obeys her husband. Now, each of these things are undermined in her booklet, but she feels it necessary nonetheless to state them as if she believes in them. So, symbols, concepts, institutions, and subjective notions of gender ensure that gender boundaries and gender hierarchies will be enforced and will be a main determinant of social relations. In the Jewish case, these combined to reinforce men's role as cultural performers and women's role as cultural facilitators. They endowed men with high cultural capital and women with low cultural capital being in the support roles. However, contradictions among the symbols, concepts, institutions, and subjective notions, and conflict with reality admit the possibility of movement of the gender boundary and recalibration of the gender hierarchy. In other words, Gender is flexible. And I want to give one example of that now. Around 1740, a man named Hillel Baal Shem, who was a contemporary of Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, and lived not too far away from him. Hillel Baal Shem was a Baal Shem, which means a, a, a shaman, someone who can connect our world with the heavenly world, someone who can help you with your problems, whether they be medical problems, financial problems, social problems. So Hillel Baal Shem wrote a book called Sefer HaKheshek, about a 400 page manuscript. You can find it in the Vernatsky Library in Kiev. And in this book, he gives all sorts of uh, solutions for problems. So medical problems, most of which have to do with fertility. Uh, he tells you, for example, let's say a couple uh, cannot have children. What do you do? Well, you take a urine sample from each of them and you set out the two cups of urine. The first one that goes rancid, that's the one that is causing the problem. So this is what we might call a quasi-scientific approach. And there are many such uh, remedies in Sefer HaKeshek. Among other things, he believes in astrology. And he says that people born on a certain day of the month have certain characteristics. He defines 34 different characteristics. Most of them apply either to a male or to a female. However, 14 of the characteristics are crossover. They can apply to either male or female. And here they are. 
either men or women can have honor, wisdom, long life, cleverness, bad luck, difficult death, hard work, either men or women can find favor with God and man, can have beauty, quickness, rhetorical skill, commercial talent, faithfulness, or success. Now note, rhetorical skill, commercial talent, success are not conventionally qualities associated with traditional women. Women who are supposed to be uh, chaste, uh, silent, and modest uh, would not show off rhetorical skill. Uh, we say that a woman's voice is sexual, they can't show off rhetorical skill. Uh, women are supposed to be in the house, right? Called Kvodal Bat Melech Tanima. The king's daughter's honor is inside. So that rules out commercial talent. So where would success come from? But here we see the beginnings of flexibility in gender, or not the beginnings, the fact of flexibility in gender, that men and women share certain qualities and qualities that are conventionally associated with one gender can be taken over by the other one as well. So this is a lead in to next week's lecture where we're going to talk about how the principles that I've outlined this, this lecture and the last lecture were challenged by reality. Thank you. And just now at the end of his talk about the tension between how gender can be determinant and how it can be flexible. I'd like to briefly take a closer look at one of the spaces that Professor Austin mentioned that I believe demonstrates how the flexibility women had could play out in practice and thereby raise a few questions for discussion. I'll bring several different examples, all from one particular space, the synagogue in Worms and its grounds in the 17th century. Just to remind everyone, that synagogue was constructed in 1175. That was actually a reconstruction of an earlier synagogue. And the Viber Shul, as we heard, was added in the early 13th century. Now, as we heard, the physical walls of the synagogue certainly separated men from women, situating women here in this instance in a separate annexed space. In the men's synagogue, the ark faced east. So the women's synagogue was along the north wall. We saw there were five small windows and one door in the center that connected to the two spaces, allowing for a partial view and for the flow of sound. As Professor Rossman said, this configuration undeniably put men at the center. A ritual celebrated on the Sabbath after Purim brings home this point, ironically, through a ritual reversal. The Sabbath honored male youths in the community. As part of the ceremony, they would march in a celebratory parade through the street and into the synagogue during Friday night services. They would also enter the women's synagogue as well as the men's and receive a blessing from the rabbi's wife. Now, as Natalie Zeman Davis has shown, in early modern Europe, rituals of inversion often permitted hierarchical role reversals, which in the end served to reinforce norms. And this is the same case as, as is with this ritual of Shabbat HaBachurim, the ritual of the youths. By entering the women's section and receiving a blessing from the rabbinite, the rabbi's wife, right after Purim, the holiday of ritual inversion, this ritual signified that normative borders and boundaries were being crossed. The corollary, of course, was that these boundaries were far more rigid throughout the year, and we've seen many examples of that in Professor Rossman's talk, whether in synagogues or in other spaces. But I'd like to consider the dynamics in the synagogue from an additional perspective, one that doesn't just come from a carnivalesque reversal that took place only once a year. What I'd like to do is to try to look at how women experience these spaces and to think about their perspective. In doing so, I found the work of Martha Howell to be very helpful. Howell wrote about women's agency within the patriarchal system. Now, women can't escape the system entirely, and I think the examples that we heard tonight about Glickel and Leah Horowitz really prove that point. There is a patriarchal system of which all women, even exceptional women, are subject to. But sometimes they can maneuver within it. Professor Rossman, my first question is, I'm wondering if you can discuss whether you see gender flexibility as what allows women to maneuver in this way. How does the frame of cultural capital, which you introduced, which seems to be a top-down way of looking at the influence women were allowed, 
connect to the idea of their agency. Using Howell's frame, let's turn back to the physical space of the Vorm Synagogue, looking for both the literal and figurative room that was available for women to maneuver. As I mentioned, the north wall um, of the men's synagogue had five windows and a small door. That door was in the early modern period known as the Yudish Tour, and its ostensible purpose was to allow women to carry a baby boy toward the men's section or into the men's section perhaps, but maybe just to the doorway for his circumcision. The woman who did so was called the Sandeket, and this was considered to be a huge honor. In fact, we have a rabbinic responsum about a woman who was in a year long period of mourning and she was honored with the invitation to be a Sandeket. This honor was deemed so great and the festivity so important that she was permitted by the rabbi to, rem to remove her clothing of mourning and to wear her festive outfit, which was normally absolutely prohibited for mourners in the you know, one year period. Now, on the one hand, it's clear that the women were not central to the circumcision ritual. It's a very male ritual, not just taking place in the men's synagogue, but it's a ritual of a boy becoming part of the male community. But on the other hand, the women were present and they had a role to play. The second question I would like to pose is, what was the experience like from their perspective? Could it be that for the women, the parts of the ritual that were more central were those in which they participated? Perhaps for them, the ritual of washing the baby before the circumcision, bringing him to the synagogue and carrying him home to his mother were actually the highlight and not what happened in the men's synagogue. Similarly, how did they think about refraining from entering the synagogue while they were menstrually impure or about the meaning of the women's commandments that they were encouraged to perform? Now, going back to this door, it was not only used during circumcision. The men quite consciously used the door and windows to ensure that certain sounds would be heard in the Viber shul. And we know from tombstones and other records that women were present in the shul, at least married women of a certain age, on a daily basis. Thus, Yush Bashamash, the sexton of the Worms community in the 17th century, writes that when it was time to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the sexton would announce this. But what he would do was walk over to the door and make his announcement in Yiddish because all the women would be in the synagogue and he wanted to make sure that they heard what was going on. Some women also participated in the sites going on in the men's synagogue. Archival records from the charity collector in Worms include the sale of synagogue seats when somebody died. When the rabbi's wife, Merla died, her seat was sold and with it, the right that she had to glimpse the Torah scroll as it was being lifted after the reading of the Torah portion in a ritual called Hagbah, which literally means just the lifting of the Torah. In many early modern synagogues, women devised creative ways that enshrined their right to see the Torah as it was being raised. To me, this action is emblematic of female agency as defined by Howell. On the one hand, the women play in a separate annex or in a gallery. On the other hand, their presence demanded that sounds be shared with them, and they utilized the spaces such as windows and doors to participate in rituals, sometimes as observers, sometimes as listeners, um, and of course, sometimes perhaps as more full participants. Now, they cannot disrupt the patriarchal structure, as we heard from Professor Rossman, but they can and do maneuver within it. To add to this, the idea that some women seats in Worms came with the right to see the Torah means, of course, that many seats did not. This hints, hints to a hierarchy within the women's section and suggests that an independent dynamic may have been taking place there. I'll bring one more example of this, which demonstrates the dynamics within the women's section and also the relationship between the women's and the men's synagogues in the city of Worms, in the synagogue that we looked at together. Now, on the holiday of Sukkot, Jewish observance mandated reciting the blessing over the four species, typically in synagogue during the morning prayers. And in Worms, it was customary that married heads of households could purchase the rights to recite the blessing first using two sets of the four species plants. And what's really, really interesting is that right after the prayer, the Hallel service, which is a psalm service at which the recitation was said, the blessing over these four species, the two men who purchased the, the right to recite the blessing over these sets of the four species would pass through the door, uh, their sets of the four species to the women, to their wives. Those wives would be the first to recite the blessing over the four species. And then one set would be transferred back to the, through the door to the men's section and everybody else would be able to recite the blessing in order of their seats. 
So here I think we have a wonderful example that shows us that there's a pecking order within the men's synagogue and within the women's synagogue. And a couple with money can purchase the right to celebrate the ritual first. And just incidentally, it goes in order of synagogue seats, but the order of synagogue seats is deeply connected to wealth and status because different seats have different values. And as we saw with the Rabbanit, different seats come with also different viewing privileges. What is really fascinating to me though, in this example, is that the wives of the men who purchase the right to, the bless to recite the blessing first actually precede almost the entire male congregation. And so there's a moment perhaps here of agency or of higher cultural capital. Now for me, the image of the four species being passed back and forth through the door is one that highlights the complexity of gender and its intersection with class and status as determinants of cultural capital. And Professor Rossman is a person who's thought a lot about also class and status in many different uh, of your writings. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on gender and other forms of status and how it fits into the model that you present of cultural capital. The final example I'd like to bring tonight actually takes place outside the synagogue where there were two courtyards. There was one courtyard that was in between the men's and the women's synagogue where they were uh, connected. And that's always known as the inner courtyard. And often the men had rituals there. And there was also an outer courtyard, which was just beyond the women's synagogue, past the women's synagogue toward the east direction, if you can imagine that slide in your head. And on the eve of Simchat Torah, the final day of uh, the long holiday season in the fall months, what you would have are two parallel ceremonies. The men would have a ceremony where they would meet and the charity collectors would sell all of the different honors that were available to men in synagogue during the upcoming year, trying to use the revenue that they would collect to fill the communal charity coffers. And this was you know, a very public celebratory um, sale that of course showed a lot of status and brought everyone together right before the prayer service. Now, what's interesting is that the women have a parallel service as well. In the outer courtyard, the men are situated in the inner courtyard, the women in the outer courtyard. Again, we can think about the space, which is more central and which is more marginal. It's very parallel to what we thought of, what we heard about the synagogue and the women's synagogue. Similarly, we have sort of courtyard A and courtyard B. Now in that ceremony, the women have their own dancing and they celebrate with the wives of the honorees. And they too have a sale of different tasks in the synagogue and these tasks are highly gendered. They include sweeping the synagogue, drawing water for the synagogue, making candles for the synagogue, folding ritual cloths that are used on the Torah. These are all very gendered activities tied to women's domestic chores. Now, what's interesting also is that the money that was raised in this sale funded wax and candles to light the women's synagogue, not the men's synagogue. So it's a separate sale and it's a separate ritual and it's independent and it's parallel. And yet there's a young man who's unmarried who is supposed to attend this ceremony as a chaperone. So this female event is independent, but it's nevertheless watched and you might even say overseen by a young unmarried man. Now he doesn't have an official role. He doesn't go and report back to the men. He's just there. Maybe he's more of a guardian than an active overseer, but he is there. And his presence seems to me indicative of the male desire to control what's happening in the women's space. It shows us once again that the patriarchal system that we heard about tonight does not disappear even as the women dance and conducted their own rituals. And with this example, my final question to Professor Rossman is, what do you think led to the greater or lesser cultural capital for women? How did the dynamic between gender as determinant and gender as flexible change over time? Thank you. Okay, am I supposed to talk now? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah, yes. Okay, as far as women having agency in uh, changing the gender boundary, uh, I think it's clear that they did. Uh, one example I can give is uh, this business of menstruants coming to the synagogue or not. It's very clear that in the 15th and 16th century, there's a struggle going on that obviously there are women who want to be in the synagogue all the time and not have this restriction and people who are uh, against it, probably some women, not just men. And so we see the halakhic authorities are trying to split the difference and they say, well, okay, uh, they can come in 
during the white days, that is when there's no blood and just the seven days they have to wait before they go to the mikvah. In those days they can come in. Or uh, on the important holidays, they can come in because uh, we know it makes them uh, feel embarrassed that they're not allowed to come in. So I think this is pressure coming from women. Uh, also, as we'll see next time, the um, different architecture of the women's section keeps changing and women keep moving closer to the center of the synagogue. And I'm convinced that this is women's uh, pressure uh, responsible for that. So that's the first question. The second question, there is a book by Susan Sarad called Women as Ritual Experts, which is an anthropological study of a group of elderly Iraqi Jewish women who came to Israel in the 1950s. These women were almost all illiterate. Uh, they certainly had no uh, formal Jewish education. What this book shows is that they developed all sorts of rituals around <laughs> their own customs. So for example, when the Torah was out, they would uh, make a certain gesture at the Torah and this gesture became sacralized. Or in preparing for uh, Pesach, they would uh, seven times inspect their rice. Uh, they don't mean to rock and eat rice on Pesach, but they would do it seven times. Again, this is a ritualized action. So the same thing in earlier periods, the, the, the actions that you mentioned, women uh, preparing the Torah binders, women making the candles, uh, these ancillary, from the men's point of view, actions became sacralized by the women and they invested in them the same feeling of holiness that men invested in uh, their rituals. What was the third question? Hello. Oh, class, class and yes. So uh, this is a common question. What happens when a woman of high class uh, comes up against a, a gender restriction? Uh, and I think what we can see is that often the gender restriction bends. Uh, for example, I've, I've found uh, women who are full-fledged members of Hevra Kadisha, of the uh, burial society, not the women's auxiliary, but they're full-fledged members. And these are obviously wealthy women and they have a say. Um, however, there is a boundary to that as well. I've never found a woman who can be elected to the uh, community council in the period we're talking about. The woman could not be elected. It wouldn't matter how rich she was, how much influence she might have, she could not be formally elected. So uh, higher class women could nudge the boundary, but uh, there still was a limit. And the fourth question. You might want to wait with that. Um, based on what you said at the beginning, I asked what you think led to greater or lesser cultural capital for women and how the dynamic between gender as determinant and gender as flexible changes over time. Okay, so that we're going to see next week how, uh, how uh, reality forces changes in the gender boundary. Deborah, would you like to uh, respond in any way or shall we take questions from the audience? I, so the I take questions. Okay, so there is a, a question that follows up on the most recent discussion. Uh, how do women see using their agency within their cultural capital as to their advantage? How do they see, for example, increased participation in the synagogue? Well, I think it's clear that women are constantly pressing uh, to have their participation recognized and to increase their participation. Uh, you see women's attendance in the synagogue gets greater as time goes on. Uh, they're more regular. Uh, we'll see this with both Glickel and Leah Horvitz. Both are very firm that women should 
to be in the synagogue every day, twice a day. Uh, I think this is something uh, innovative. Uh, and like I said before, the uh, just look at the, you can look at, to me, 400 years of history, women moving closer and closer to the center of the synagogue until they became rabbis. Uh, and this is from the pressure of women that this that goes on. But I don't see it as something that just happened in the 20th century. I see something started in the 16th century. We are all pa partisans of the early modern period. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deborah, would you like to comment on? Um... I mean, I, I agree with what Professor Rossman just said. Um, Tommy Mocha, I think. <laughs> no, I do. Okay, I agree with what Moshe just said. Um, in the 17th century, which is the period of, of Glickel and the period I spoke about, women go to the synagogue, at least married women of a certain status, um, but maybe all married women go to, this, go to the synagogue daily, twice a day. And I think that that's something that's important to them. And it's something that's recognized by the community on their tombstones, in communal memory books, uh, where they're memorialized for these pious actions. And I think this is a period that I'm looking forward to hear more about next week in the lecture. So one of the questions I had was about geogra geographic differences. Now you both work on uh, Ashkenazi Jewish communities. Um, uh, Moshe is focusing obviously most of, uh, of your career on, on Poland, Polish Jewish history. Deborah, you are working on, on um, German uh, Jewish history. I don't know whether any of you have had a chance also maybe look at other Sephardic or Italian uh, Jewish um, practices to discern either the, the you know, architecture, the architectural changes, or as, as one of the uh, questions is about the Torah binders, which in our Ashkenazi tradition featured names of the baby and the father, uh, although it was made by women versus the Italian tradition on Torah binders, which featured the name of the woman who created and embroidered it. And I think there were also differences in the participation in the circumcision ceremony between the different geographic uh, uh, areas. So I wonder whether um, either or both of you could comment on, on some of those cultural differences uh, in different, different uh, geographic uh, and cultural areas. Deborah, do you, know? do you want to go first, Moshe? I would be uh, So obviously, yes, there are differences. Uh, if you just say Yiddish, Western Yiddish and Eastern Yiddish. Uh, liturgy, there are, uh, the liturgies are different in the uh, uh, Western communities than in the Eastern communities. Uh, customs. Some of the customs that uh, Deborah mentioned don't exist in the East. So yes, obviously there are differences. One of the problems in Jewish studies is that uh, we're very parochial and we're trained because of languages mainly to concentrate on a certain area and it's hard to break out of that. Uh, even at my advanced age, I'm trying to do that, but it's uh, a long process. I would just add that I think um, some of the differences that we see are, are in Italy, um, where there's some liturgy that really does recognize women's role as, as different, whether it's through the Torah binders and, and blessings about them, or whether it's um, the morning prayer service where we have some liturgy in the morning about the blessing where um, men think, Thank God for not making them women, and we have different versions uh, in the in the Italian rite. And I think in previous conversations that I've had with Moshe over the years, I think we see some differences in the 18th century. I think Moshe has argued uh, convincingly that in Poland we see a lot of increased cultural capital for women in the 18th century. And yet, when I look at the West, I see sometimes attempts to really crack down and control women's behaviors in the synagogues and in the cemeteries and in other places. And that would probably be much more in line with what was happening in, in the host community. And, and that's actually a, a, a great question because there is a question about uh, the, the 
connection between changes and transformations within the larger community uh, and the society in which Jews live and how much some of these differences are reflecting that culture uh, outside. And, and I don't know whether either one of you could see in your sources direct re uh, references or direct co um, correspondence with what is going on in the, in the broader society. Okay, well, this goes back to something we talked about last week, what I call the shared band of culture. And what's shared largely is what is not spoken, what is assumed, what is taken for granted. And of course, gender is one of the <laughs> main things that is taken for granted. So if uh, women are supposed to be chaste, silent, and obedient, Christian women, Jewish women, the same thing as, as we've seen. Uh, but there are differences. So in the church, in the period we're talking about, uh, everybody stood. Men stood on one side, women stood on the other side. In the synagogue, as we've seen, uh, women start out uh, being in a separate area that's separated uh, by a wall or a barrier or, or what have you. So there's a difference there. So there are things that are shared and there are differences. So uh, I think we only have uh, uh, time for one more question. Uh, some rituals require women to be more active, as Dr. Kaplan pointed out, an official ritual, the Sandeket, for instance. But for example, in Halitza, the widow is active, the brother-in-law is passive. Do you see a difference? What do you mean to see a difference? I guess between the passivity and activity that which that that the rituals of women uh, seem to require women to be more active. I well, I, I think halitza comes from the Bible, and it was seen as uh, a punishment for the man for not doing his duty. So that even <laughs> it, it was so shameful what he was doing that the, even a woman was allowed to shame him. I mean, what she does is spit in his shoe. Uh, so the idea was to make it that you shouldn't do this. You should marry her. And to emphasize that you really should be marrying her. So even a woman was given the opportunity to shame the man. Uh, but of course, if things worked out, Khalitsa was supposed to be uh, done all the time, but uh, this idea that the woman had, had to take the active role had to be respected. And I think Halitza is one of those examples where you have these cultural differences. It's uh, different practice, the levered marriage versus Halitza, for instance, and the uh, Islamic uh, communities in, in Jews living in Islamic communities versus obviously in Christian Europe where polygamy was not accepted. So the Halitza became a necessity in some, in some ways. Uh, would you have any other parting thoughts uh, to the conversation? Deborah? Um, I would just add to what you just said about Halitza, Magda, that I think it's another opportunity where we can see gender intersecting with class. Because if a woman had wealthy relatives, they would be, uh, on her side and her brother-in-law would not be as easily able to extort her as a woman who was alone uh, without support or without resources. And so I think it's really interesting how on the ground um, we see these different kinds of um, concerns coming together and impacting the actions of women um, versus the theory and the question between theory and, and practice. So I'll just say that's what we're going to talk about next week. Okay, so we're looking forward to seeing you next week uh, at the same time, same place. Uh, and we will uh, have as a, a, a Professor uh, Karl Bach as a respondent. So I'm looking forward to learning more. Thank you so much for joining us. Just thank you for your support and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>